I've been teaching almost 40 years now in a number of different capacities. So one-on-one -on -one teaching, classes, master classes, workshops, published materials, methods, and now video. So I thought I'd offer some insights and maybe some advice to those of you out there who are also teaching or thinking about it. We live in a society that values certifications, degrees, a piece of paper from some institution that says, you know, gives us the stamp of approval that says, you know what you're talking about. But music is a little bit different still, I think, because in music, the proof is in the pudding. If you can do it, if you can demonstrate that you can play well and you can communicate that to someone else to show them how to do what you're doing, you know, you've really got what it takes. So the first thing I want to say to people that are thinking about teaching, but feeling, you know, maybe they don't have enough experience, is that really you don't need all that much experience. What you need is to be a few steps ahead of the students that you take on. But I would also suggest, of course, that you be transparent with them and let them know what your limitations are. And if they're on board with paying you for you to show them what you know, well, there you go. Then you'll continue to progress as a musician yourself, continue to practice, continue to play, and broaden your experiences. The teaching is just going to be an adjunct to that. It's just going to help you grow. And as long as you do that, you're going to stay you know, a step ahead of your students. I didn't start teaching because I had a burning desire to teach. I had a burning desire to play the guitar well and to write and record music. But that wasn't paying the bills. So in order to make a little extra money, I decided I'd start teaching on the side. Now, teaching isn't playing. It isn't performing and it isn't writing and recording. But it isn't terribly far afield either. You know, it does put a guitar in your hands and it does help solidify, you know, your knowledge and your understanding in a big way. If you really want to learn something well, teach it. In any case, the first thing that I want to advise anyone to do that is teaching or thinking about teaching is to get a piece of paper and write down your why. You want to understand your own motives, the reasons that you're doing it. That's going to help you later when you need to address these issues such as, you know, how much should I teach? How much balance? What else should I be doing as a musician? And also avoiding burnout. And I'm going to talk about that later. A guitar teacher is actually all four of those terms that I just put up. Teacher, coach, guide, and mentor. So let's talk about that and get a little bit more clear about these different roles. Generally speaking, a teacher is someone who conveys information, probably structured information, you know, so you learn this and then this and then this and, and you develop a knowledge base. But generally speaking, the term teaching kind of suggests more of an intellectual aspect to it. A coach, on the other hand, is someone who evaluates more specifically where an individual is relative to that information. So in other words, how are you applying that information? Are you pulling it off? If you're not, why not? You know, what's standing in the way? And, and can we develop a system, you know, to get around that? As a coach, you're really acting as an adjunct to their own listening, to their own self-correction mechanism, because listening is the self-correction mechanism. You make a mistake and then you, you know, you try it again to, to get it right. Well, the coach then comes in and will hear the subtleties, the difference, the elements, the flaws in, in someone's playing that they're not hearing. You can then feed that back to them, let them know where to put their attention. They fix those problems and then everything sounds better. Whenever I give one-on-one -on -one lessons and we're talking about technique, I consider my role to be really a coach. A third role is guide. And guidance is really important because you have more experience than they do, and so you can see further. You can see their path down the road, and you can then tell them, you know, what they can expect, how, it, you know, what's, what's it going to look like, and how are they going to get from point A to point B. You can also shed light on how they're doing overall, uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses, and, you know, how might they approach working on those things. This is really important because it affects their motivation. 
Sometimes perspective and context is everything. And as the guide, it's your job to supply that bigger context. And then finally, we have the term mentor, which I kind of think of really as a guide, but on steroids, because the mentor is, is a, maybe even a more elevated position, maybe a little higher respect, somebody who has even more experience. And so you can function as, as a even broader guide, even maybe beyond guitar. It all starts with desire. What is it that they want to play? That's why they're there, you know? So that's really what you want to find out in the first place. The motive of the younger player, most likely, if you're teaching someone who's eight or nine years old, uh, it's to please the teacher. So weekly lessons are a really good idea for a younger player because it, it puts them in routine and then they know that they're going to be seeing the teacher. So, you know, they need to practice, right? It's also great if they're curious about music, if they actually even like what they're doing. But, you know, you're not going to find a whole lot of passion, generally speaking, in, in a younger player. I mean, I know that when I was younger and I started playing, I didn't have the, the passion for guitar and music that I ended up developing later. You know, it started out as I liked music. It was a curiosity. But, you know, I, I just kind of started out because guitar was kind of cool. It was an interesting instrument. The bands I liked, you know, were guitar bands and, and I liked the way it sounded. So I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll give this a shot. But it started out as a curiosity and then it just kind of grew from there. So I would expect that for most younger players, that's pretty much what it's going to look like. Teenagers, on the other hand, you know, really just want to look good in the eyes of other teenagers. It's about their peers. Now, there's also another motivation, though, that comes into play. They don't want to look incompetent or foolish in front of you, the teacher, right? <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if you can use that or not, but in any case, usually that's a negative motivation that comes into play, you know, wanting to not look bad. So they want to, you know, to practice in order to impress. Adults, on the other hand, you know, probably a range of, of motives, but for the most part, to some degree, at least, it comes from a love of music. You know, they like songs and they want to play, they want to play their favorite songs. You don't need to know all the motives and there are, frankly, are always a, a mixed set of motives in any case. But the more insight you do have to the motive of the person coming in, the more you're going to be able to fan the flames of their inspiration and their motivation. Just kind of sit back and notice them as a person, notice what their interests are, notice what seems to spark them. If you keep somebody motivated, you keep their interest alive and you fan that flames, you know, their inspiration, you'll be amazed at the results that they end up creating. The first thing I do when I take on a new client is I ask, you know, what their goals are. What is it that they want to do but can't or they feel that they can't do it as well as they'd like? Or what is the area they need clarity in? What are they confused about? You know, why are they here? Now, if we're talking about, of course, a, a younger player who, who's taking lessons, they don't really know. I mean, it, it's a vague thing. They're there because they want to learn how to play guitar but they don't have any, any real specific ideas. But it's still important to ask that question and have that conversation because as the teacher, you kind of need to set uh, the path. You need to define what it is that we're gonna be working on, what direction are we gonna take, you know, if we're gonna work out of a book or a series of books or, or maybe more than one book, what books are they and why? There's also questions, you know, should they read music? And, and you need to address those particular things. Now, some people have really strong feelings on that one way or the other. I tend to be more practically based. I, I think that I take their goal and I say, what is the most direct way to get to that goal? So, you know, if they want to play rock guitar, you know, that's obviously why I designed the, the methods that I did, uh, rock and metal, around tablature based and, and understanding rhythm notation because those are the skills you know, that really matter, reading music, not so much. And if somebody comes in and all they really want to do is, is sing and just accompany themselves on guitar, well, you know, they don't need everything that's, you know, in, in a lead guitar method, obviously. They need to understand their, their open chords. They need to be, they need some help in, 
maybe switching between them, some of the, the tricks to be able to do that, and some practice approaches to be able to do that efficiently, effectively, and they need to know a bunch of strumming patterns, uh, maybe some finger style patterns or whatever. But it depends on, it depends on your goals, and so ask, you know, obviously ask them what their goals are, figure out the best way to get to that. If somebody doesn't have any well-defined goals or they're a younger player, again, that just has a, a general concept, great. Uh, a non-stylistic guitar method, some book one, you know, might be a fine place to start, and maybe that even includes, you know, reading some music notation. I would say that although reading music notation is itself a skill that, you know, has kind of a limited application, it's not, in my view, all that critical to master in order to play well or even create music. On the other hand, though, it does help tell a story and get people started on the concept of music as sounds or pitches arranged in time. And, and that's kind of an important fundamental. So, you know, you might include it. You might also include it as a, as a sideline, for example, working in maybe the rock or metal guitar method and then working out of a book one or a sight reading method at the same time just to kind of develop these things in parallel. Now, a minute ago, I was saying that it's all about their goals, but that is to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt because at the same time, they don't really understand what it takes to reach their goals necessarily. And they may, may be thinking, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to, you know, I'm going to play dream theater. Well, they don't realize that it takes a lot of buildup of certain fundamentals to get to that point. And so you might need to step in and, and say, you know, pull back the reins a bit and say, okay, well, we need to do these, these things first in order to get there. But at the same time, if you're going to do that, it is very important that you understand very specific connections between what you're showing them and where it is that they want to get and that you can explain that and that they understand how those things are connected. Because if you don't do that, you are squandering your own uh, trustworthiness. You know, you only have so much trust capital. And as you sit down with lessons, you know, they're interested, but you do need to either move toward their goals or show them how what you're doing is moving toward their goals if it doesn't feel like it. So I like to split the difference. You know, I'll, I'll sprinkle a couple of riffs in, you know, if somebody's interested in a particular band. It's like, well, let's, let's take a listen to that music. Oh, here's the riff. This is what it is. I'll just throw it at them. And maybe they don't have what it takes to play that riff well, but they're, they're chewing on it, you know, and, and they're working on it. And, and that's good for them to, to do that, to test themselves on it. At the same time, I'll come over here and we'll be working on some a method that's got some more fundamentals in it. And then, we start drawing the parallels between the method and the songs that they're learning. But in any case, the real success is going to happen when you understand what their inspiration is and you connect what you're doing to that inspiration. The more effectively you can do that, the better everything's going to work. Now let's talk a little bit about coaching uh, more specifically. So when, when it comes to coaching, what you're really doing is looking for the things that are broken. So look for the break spots. Somebody starts playing, there's a hesitation, there's a, a screw up, there's um, you know a flaw of some sort. Now maybe they're not flaws that derail them. Maybe they actually get through the riff or they get through the part, but it's just not quite right. Well then you might dig in and say, well, well, why? That's really the question to ask. And let's take a look and see what caused it to fall apart. Maybe it's a train wreck mess up and they completely stop. Okay, well, you know, zero in and find, you know, what's going on there. Was it, you know, a problem in the left hand? Was it you couldn't get to the chord at the right time? Or maybe you can't get to that chord reliably? Or maybe they're supposed to pick the fifth string and they missed it and they hit the fourth string whatever it is, stop a minute, simplify, and zero in on that one thing. So if it's, let's say, you know, you're supposed to pick the fifth string and then the sixth string, and ideally they want to be able to do that without looking. Well, you need to be able to pick one string, move to the other, back and forth, 
uh, throw some some examples at them that might simplify do nothing in the left hand and just make them do the motions they need to do until they can get that motion. Or if it's in the left hand, it's maybe it's one chord to another chord. Make them make the shift. Don't play a piece of music. Don't put it in time. Just play the chord. This is the problem, you know, to maybe play a G chord after a D chord. Well, if you need to do that motion and you can't do that motion, that's the problem. Zero in on the problem, you know, work on that, fix that problem. And then after you can do that, put it back in context. You know, as musicians, we tend to think of notes as being what we're doing. We're executing notes. But when you're actually playing, it's not about the notes. That's the end result. What we're really doing is we're making certain motions. So if you watch the player or the student play and you see that they're, they're having trouble with a certain motion, you know, that's really where you want to focus your attention. And as you do that, you're going to have a lot more insight just by looking at the, at the idea of the motion as opposed to the note. Now, when the note messes up or there's a hesitation, you know, that's a clue that there's a problem. But what's the problem? The problem isn't the note. The problem is the motion. Now, as a next step, once notes can be executed in time, so you can pick the right string that you want to pick, you can hit the chord or get your finger in the right place reasonably quickly, then the question becomes, you know, can you do that? Can you execute it all together at once? Now, invariably, as a student is going to go to play an example, they're trying to get the example up to tempo. And you can tell them, a thousand times, you know, slow down and do it right, you know, and that's what we want. Of course, you want quality over the quantity of notes. You want quality over the speed of notes. You can't compromise the quality. You get that right, the speed will happen, but inevitably people will go for the speed and then let the quality kind of fall apart, which is why things don't sound good. So really what's happening is that the student has developed some unconscious muscle memory of playing that example at a certain speed. Because muscle memory isn't just the motion, it's also the speed of the motion. So as they try to play this thing up to speed, you know, they're playing close to that tempo range of the final result. Maybe they're not quite at the tempo, but they're probably, you know, reasonably close to it, you know, maybe 10% or 20% less. And they're messing up even at that speed. So the answer is they haven't slowed down enough. You can tell people a thousand times to slow down. They will not do what you say, they'll do what you do. So as the teacher, what you need to do is actually demonstrate the speed you want them to play it at, the clarity, the connection of the notes or the, the evenness or whatever point it is that you're making. You need to demonstrate that and say, okay, now do that. And in a lot of cases, people will need to slow down to maybe 50% of the speed of the song in order to get the quality. There's a problem with that though. When you slow down something to 50% or even less, it doesn't sound like the song anymore. So they don't know what it's supposed to sound like, so they don't know how to do it. And that's where you can step in as a teacher and you can say, oh, it goes like this because you know you presumably know something about how rhythm notation works and pulse, and you can actually slow it down to 40% of tempo and, and actually play it. And then they can actually copy that, and they can copy it at a speed that they can actually take conscious control of, of the muscle memory and get it right, connect all the dots, connect all the notes, make it even or whatever, and then from that point, they can speed it up. In my experience, Usually the problem is they've never slowed it down enough to get it right. If they do that, usually it doesn't take but a couple minutes to get it right. You get it right a couple times and then from there you can speed it up pretty quick. And then as you speed it up, the, uh, the connection of the notes or whatever it is, whatever was causing the problem, uh, it'll be fixed and that'll stick as, as they play it faster. So at that point then, of course, it's your job to shut up and, and let them repeat it. You know, they do it, they do it a couple times, and probably they'll start pushing too fast, they'll start messing up. Then you have to call their attention, say, hold on, 
come back and let's get it right. Get it into the ballpark or the tempo where they can do it and do it with control and quality. It's not just about speed though. You can also get them to shorten the example. So in other words, suppose you were teaching a beginner a simple rhythm and you're trying to get them to execute pulse, to tap your foot, and to play an upbeat against the pulse. So maybe your example is down, up, up, down, up, up. So there's your rhythm. You want them to tap it out and you want them to, you know, to hit these upbeat accents. Well, what do beginners typically do is they're going to want to tap their foot on the accents, you know, one, two, three, like that. And of course, then there is no, there's no pulse, there's no groove, and, and that's not going to work. So what we got to do is, is slow it down to the point where they can do that. But it's not just about speed, because sometimes playing things super slow can actually make them even more difficult. Right? So what we want to do is chop them down into a smaller example. You know, what's the most simple example? Well, how about just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Get them to play that and then get them to recognize the upbeat of two, one, two, and three, four, one, two, and three, four. Now, that might take a little work. You might have to break that down into a smaller piece. It might just be one and two and. You might have to mark every um, eighth note. You, you put taps one and make it mechanical. You know, go to whatever level they need to. You keep backtracking, simplifying until you get what they can do. And then once you can do that, then you start building it forward. And then you add the second upbeat, you know, one, two, three, four. And then you keep going from there. But you always have to be able to understand where they are what, is, what the goal is that they're trying to do, and when you see their break point, think of different ways to, you know, to, to simplify, to get that part right, and then build on to it and build it back up. Of course, the real goal that we're after is not teaching you know, this or that song, but it's really teaching competence as a musician with, with all of the skills, all of the techniques. So what I'll often do is actually throw additional variations at them. In other words, once they get, you know, that core rhythm that we're after and you build it up and they play it, it's like, okay, great. They seat that into muscle memory a bit. So now they're doing it uh, by feel. Then I'm going to throw a variation in them. Okay, let's add this beat here or this, this upbeat or let's change this note and, and throw a different motion in. Now they can uh, break the muscle memory they've established because we're going to tweak it and do something a little different. That requires uh, a little bit of conscious interaction with what had become muscle memory. So on the one hand, you build muscle memory and then you break it and, and create a variation of it. And by doing that over and over and over and over, you see you get conscious control over anything and you have muscle memory that is modifiable and you can do anything you want. That's what you really want. The real question when it comes to effective coaching, I think, is the question why. If anything doesn't sound perfect or flawless, there's always a reason. And it's not personal and it's not an issue of talent. A technique is a very mechanical thing. And there's always a reason why. There's a reason why it works or why it sounds good. There's a reason why it doesn't sound good. And I would say that if you're the coach, it's your job to be able to watch and listen and figure out you know, why is it not working? And then you can devise strategies to, to get around that, to develop um, the ability to do it. Barring a physiological handicap, any student is really capable of doing any technique. If you have the right approach and you can break it down enough, you know, playing the guitar is as simple as moving one finger at a time. Break it down to whatever level they need and guide them and then gradually put it back together and, and you can teach anybody anything. At the very beginning, I was talking about understanding your own motives. And I think that that's important because 
there, there aren't right or wrongs here, but the better you know yourself and you know the reasons why you're doing things, uh, the better choices you can make about you know, who you're willing to teach, what you're willing to teach, how much you're willing to teach, you know, what's going to work for you. Early on when I was teaching, I, I noticed that there was a certain threshold, like a certain amount I could teach before I started to, to get sick of it and I'd, I'd burn out on it and start to really, really hate it. And of course, I don't think that that's good. That's not good for me and it's not good for the students, right? You don't want to be just doing something for the money. I mean, it's fine if money is a primary motive, okay, but you can't hate what you're doing and just do it for the money or you're, you're going to do a lousy job. So, you know, you need to find a balance point. And that comes back to, to knowing yourself and knowing your motives, but knowing your whys. For me, teaching was always a matter of sharing what it was that I was passionate about. So I needed to invest a certain amount of time in myself growing as a player. If I was doing that, then I would be able to come back over here and share it with people and teach and, and, and respect and enjoy where, wherever they were. Or even maybe if what they're doing isn't what I'm doing, as long as I'm happy with what I'm doing, you know, I can sit and, and patiently help them. But if this is taking all my time and energy and it's eclipsing what I'm trying to do and I stop growing as a player. Now I'm just going through the motions and I'm going to burn out. Now, some of you out there are going to get uh, a certain charge or a, a, a sense of satisfaction out of seeing somebody, you know, get it and seeing the light go on and they get better, you know, great. That's going to enable you to probably teach more. And I get that to a degree as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, when I walk away from it, I'm happy that people are getting what they need, okay? Uh, I enjoy that, and I enjoy the, the, I guess, the puzzle of solving the coaching problems. So that's kind of an interesting thing for me. But at the end of the day, when I walk away, I need to be satisfied uh, as an artist, as a player myself. And if I'm putting others ahead of me, then I'm kind of going down the, the wrong path, and that's not going to work. So there's no right or wrong here, but it, it all comes back to you, to knowing yourself, to knowing what is the right balance between, you know, what, you, what you're doing and what you should ideally be doing. And it's always kind of trying to fine tune it. It's like watching your own motives, your own motivations, your, your own, you know, level of interest and, and noticing, you know, what's working for you. I remember back at the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music where I taught for a number of years that after I got going there, started to get more and more students and my roster got pretty full and it was frankly about as much as I could, as, as I could teach comfortably. And I remember at one point thinking, okay, well, I want to expand this so I need to move into classes. I need to bring in people because of course, in many cases, I am saying the same thing you know, or a very similar thing to a number of people. So, you know, let's, you know, kill 10 birds with one stone. Let's do a class, bring everybody in. And that basically allows me to make more money as the teacher than, than a one-on-one -on -one thing. And it also keeps me from having to repeat myself constantly. Now, I remember the first time that I sat down to create a curriculum. Um, I, I worked on it and it took a lot of extra time unpaid time. So I'm, I'm doing all this teaching work, creating this curriculum, and I'm thinking it'll be okay because when I'm done, then it'll be easy. I'll, I'll have the curriculum in place and I'll just show up and I'll teach the class and, you know, I'll have 15 people in the class and, and I'll, you know, make five times as much money as I did with on individual lessons and it'll allow the, the class structure to become bigger and it'll help more people. So it's a win-win all the way around, right? Well, what ended up happening was I got to the next semester and started the same class over again. I was totally unsatisfied and I was bored and, you know, I knew there was something wrong, seriously wrong. It got worse and worse and, and I figured out finally what was going on. 
And it's that I'm a kind of a person who needs to be breaking new ground. I want to be trying something new. I want to be developing. And the concept of running through the same curriculum, even the second time, was just something I couldn't do. You know, I could never be the kind of teacher that you'd have in a school that would teach the same you know, thing year after year to new kids because it just feels like, you know, I'm like a rat on a wheel just doing the same thing over and over, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why, you know, I got really tired of teaching beginners is because it's too, too similar, too much the same stuff. But as we get to more advanced issues, the puzzle becomes more interesting. The coaching puzzle starts to become very unique, you know, at more advanced levels. So I'm more interested in that. So in any case, the amount of teaching you do or the kind of teaching you do, it really just comes down to knowing yourself, knowing what's going to create that sense of, of satisfaction. And, and I would say that if you're going to sit down and teach a lesson, if you can't focus on, on the student's best interest, you know, there's a problem. And, and you've got to, you know, pull back, either stop doing what you're doing or restrict it. Um, find another balance that, that's going to work for everyone. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell. I'll see you in the next video.